So I hope everybody's had a chance to network and meet people and um, talk, because certainly that's an important part of that. So our second session for the morning, um, I put together a uh, panel of scientists. So these are the people that Nate and I and Shannon that we rely on. We cannot be experts in lots of things. So these are the people that we call when um, we have questions that come from you. So I can't thank this panel enough for all the times that I bug them with questions and can you come do this or can you do that or can you explain this to me. So it's very important for us as um, extension uh, agents that we have the specialists at the universities um, to help us. And even though um, we're in Maryland, we um, cross, you know, we're not far from Delaware. so. Um, we cross paths um, with them a right good bit and work together. So we're going to do the same kind of format. I'll ask uh, each one of the scientists to introduce themselves. They can talk um, a little bit um, about their research and then we'll entertain questions from you. Now remember, um, one of our jobs is to bring you research-based information, but also to find out what information that you want. So what is the research that the, this panel can be working on? So I think they heard some ideas this morning. I'm sure that they can get some more. So Mark, since you're closest to me, I'll start with you. That's why I want you to sit here. Am I on? Am I? Okay. Oh, here, oh, that's right. Here we go. Okay. So my name is Mark Van Gessel. I'm an extension weed specialist with the University of Delaware. Been located at uh, Georgetown at the Research Center. I've been there for about 25 years. Um, my responsibility is primarily grain crops, but I also do a lot in uh, commercial vegetables as well. Um, my research runs the gamut from herbicide testing to organic research. I'm uh, responsible for maintaining uh, about two acres of certified organic uh, uh, fields that we have been doing a lot of weed work, work on. Um, we've uh, um, got started um, pretty heavy with, with organic about six or seven years ago working with a project with Stephen, uh, like some on the farmer panel. You know, I was looking for an opportunity to kind of test the waters and I called Stephen and I think I ended up jumping in head first on it. Uh, and and uh, so it, it was part of, and we're going to talk about that more, but it was a reduced tillage uh, cover crop Green research project, uh, and it was done between Penn State, Beltsville, and the University of Delaware, and get, gained a lot of experience with that. Um, we do a lot of our organic herbicide testing, uh, do a lot of work with with tillage, and uh, for for weed control, some of the the newer uh, uh, cultivation equipment that that's available, and uh, we've got some projects that we're going to be moving into this year. One of the things that I want to look at is kind of the merge between tillage and the uh, no-till. And we've got a strip-till unit we're going to work with this year and try to incorporate some cover crops with more mechanical weed control for grain crops. So I'm going to leave it at that and pass it on down. Thanks for having me here as well. This is a meeting we've been coming to now for some years now. So some of you who've been coming to this meeting have seen me present before. It's great to be back here again. Uh, Stephen Mursky, I'm a research scientist with Department of Agriculture, ARS. It's just about a mile up the road from University of Maryland. So we're right in that corridor. Uh, we been working there now for over 10 years. I've been working in organic research, seems like 18, 20 years now practically. I've been doing something related to organic cover crops, nutrient management, and weeds. Um, I predominantly work in field crops, like corn, soybean, and wheat. Do not do too much in the vegetable arena, but my whole research program focuses pretty heavily all around cover crops cover crop management, integration into the cropping system, quantifying the benefits of the cover crops, trying to reduce the barriers so that it works on your system and, and hopefully that we get more adoption. And so that brings me down a lot of different corridors I never expected. I mean, predominantly focusing on nutrient management and weed management, do a lot in the both conventional and the organic realm. And, and we're having a meeting at the end of this meeting with some of the conventional producers that we're doing on-farm research with as well. So we're, we're doing in both camps focusing on a lot of different questions, water, nutrients, weeds, but now we're also breeding cover crops. So that's why I'll probably bring that up a little bit because we are focusing on breeding a bunch of different types of cover crops. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Oh, this one's not working. Yeah, give a minute. No, turn it off. Ready? Okay. So my name is Saruti Hooks, and I'm a researcher at the University of Maryland. I'm an entomologist. Um, at least I got my PhD in entomology. But I also have a uh, master's degree in weed science, so I do a combination of both. Uh, I probably do equal amount of weed research as well as entomology research, and I also do some nematode research. So my um, program is somewhat multidisciplinary. Um, I work in both vegetable crop as well as agronomic crops, such as soybeans, um, corn. I did a little wheat earlier, but I don't work in wheat systems anymore. And I mainly do a lot of intercropping. Um, habitat manipulation, things with using flowering plants to see how they can um, attract beneficial insects. But at the same time, similar to other people here, I do a lot of cover crop um, research because I tend to see with cover crops, I can try to manipulate both insects and weeds as well as nematodes below the soil. Michelle Cavagelli, I'm also in uh, the same lab that Stephen's in at Beltsville. It's on the other side of the bridge. Um, I'm a soil scientist by training and I've kind of become an agronomist over the years. And Jenny mentioned that we've been doing these conferences for 13 years, so I don't know if that means 2005 or 2004 was the first or something, somewhere around before anyway. I've been in Beltsville since 1999 and when I first got here, <clears throat> here being over there, is uh, I was interested in organic and uh, it's actually Jenny's predecessor, Paul somebody, who did, I believe, the first one, but you were there, I think, for that first one. And it was in this big old cavernous building, and it was kind of cold. So this is really improved. <laughs> We've gone to the 4-H park to just be college. So. Yeah, so, uh, and what, what one thing that was really cool, and I think Jenny mentioned this this morning, is that when we first started with this group, you know, we had Bill Mason, Ed Fly, Aaron Cooper, and that generation of folks, and now their kids are here. That's pretty exciting. That's really neat. Um, my research is on uh, long-term cropping systems where we have a long-term trial that was started in 1996, and we have organic and conventional next to each other. We have three different organic methods, short rotations, medium rotations, and long rotation. So the conversation this morning about rotation length was very interesting to me, and so I'd like to pursue that in, in individual conversations as well. <clears throat> Um, I t that takes up a lot of my time managing that project, but then I also do a fair amount of uh, nu nutrient management work, trying to address some of these issues of nitrogen and phosphorus. People talked about overloading your soils with phosphorus by using too much poultry litter, so we spent a lot of time, and Stephen and others at, at Beltsville, have, we've all worked together on looking at ways to balance, keep your nitrogen and phosphorus in balance on organic farms. So that's what I spend a lot of time doing. Um, my name's Kate Everts. I'm with the University of Maryland, and um, um, I actually work for University of Maryland College Park, but I'm located at a research center that's on the Lower Eastern Shore in Salisbury. Um, and I work on vegetable diseases, so I'm focused strictly on um, vegetable diseases, but I've worked, at, um, we, at, the, at our farm, we have we have about two and a half acres of certified organic land, and I've been interested in organic for a long time. Um, and so although I do research on both conventional and organic um, vegetable production and reducing diseases in that area, um, I have some big projects that over the years that have um, been focused on organic. So um, I've worked on um, cover crops a lot. I uh, worked on su suppressing disease with legume cover crops, um, started actually working with some people from Beltsville who worked on um, hairy vatch and, um, you know, looking at the suppression of cover of disease suppression with um, using a hairy vatch cover crop and then kind of branched out into uh, crimson clover and other uh, different cover crops. I've, I've worked with um, biofungicides and biorationals that are um, relisted that can be used if your certifier approves in organic production. So work some in that area and um, look a lot uh, at varietal resistance or cultivar resistance, which is a really nice uh, inexpensive tool for growers if it's available to use in organic systems. So, you know, a lot of different tactics to try to um, um, reduce diseases. Okay, so what questions um, do you have in the audience? Yes, ma'am. 
from different members of the panel on this. So um, back in 98, 99, when the NLP first, you know, the USA put out calls for comments, and, you know, prior to that, you know, organic standards in different states were established by people who lived a certain way. They wanted to eat a certain way and they farmed a certain way. And California had the standards Michigan, but they were pretty much the same. Then here comes the national standard by the USDA, which is great because it takes us all in a, let's say, a less pesticide eating, you know, pesticide consuming um, uh, customers, consumers. Um, so whenever we do something broad like that, the standards are not going to go up, they're going to go down. But still, we're moving in a less pesticide consuming and uh, hopefully less chemical consuming uh, vegetables as a society and meat. Okay, so that's been my perspective about the USDA uh, organic standards, no problem. Uh, now, there's so many things that are being allowed in. Uh, so many uh, loopholes, let's call them, especially when it comes to things that are imported from other countries that get into the uh, grocery stores as organic. I know there was a pineapple thing uh, from Costa Rica that was reported to the USDA, and they didn't do anything about it. This was just an article I read a couple of days ago on this. Uh, so that's an example. We can't control what really goes on in other countries, no matter what our rules are. So there's all this, let's say, mixture or contamination of our standards. And now we recently passed that hydroponics are considered organic, which was something that the originators of organics were saying no to. It was all about soil-based growing. So, so organic is becoming very muddled for some of us who live this way because we're vegetarian or we're interested in organic or whatever. When I first started eating organic wheat back in the 70s, I lived in Brooklyn and there was one store that carried organic vegetables. I had to drive all the way out to Brighton Beach and then go back to Flatbush once a week. Okay. So now, here we are and a, a new group of people who, like the originators of organic, live this way, are coming out with what they're calling the real organic, a new standard um, to, you know, work towards similar to the certified naturally grown. And I'm just wondering, one, are you guys aware of that? And two, if you are, um, where do you see our government, which is now managing our organic process, um, where do you see the role of our government going versus the people who sort of grassroots live this way, have these standards, what they want for their family? Okay, Steve, Steve, or Michelle, you want to start? Okay, Michelle. I can, can start. I can speak to that a little bit, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, we are the federal government, so we're here to help you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I started off in organic, not not as a scientist, but as maybe more of an activist in the '80s. So not as long as you, but I was actively involved in Kansas in the organic farming community and I edited the newsletter of the Kansas Organic Producers and was engaged that way as, as a non-government person. <clears throat> so I understand what you're saying in terms of the need to keep the uh, standards pure, for lack of a better term. That's probably not a good word, but I know, I know, I know what you're getting at though. You know, that there's a vision that maybe has been diluted. <clears throat> Um, so I understand where you're coming from, and but now as a federal scientist that doesn't deal with any of that certification stuff, my role is to just do organic research on whatever is defined as organic. So that's what I have to do as a federal scientist. And there's plenty of activists still in the organic community, and I kind of leave that to them. And so that's the way I've kind of addressed that issue. The thing about international imports is interesting to me. <clears throat> and I actually asked that question to another federal employee because I was concerned about that same thing you're concerned about. 
and she did not accept that there was a problem, which was very interesting to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. And so there's an issue there that needs to be dealt with. Me as a federal scientist, I can't deal with that. I can't, you know. Right. That's the problem is that the bureaucrats, and, so to speak, or the politicians, and then there are the people like yourselves who are doing the work. Yeah. And it's very consumer, you know, and we're not like a small country like France that everything's organic and we know it and it's cool. We're this huge country, you know, with 50 countries and, you know, I knew when this change happened in 2000 that what we were doing was giving the agriculture the opportunity to get it, the opportunity to clean up. So it's okay that we would lose some standards, but now the corruption that's starting to happen and the denial of the bureaucrats that there is a problem is our problem, the consumer's problem. It, that's right, and I would argue that that is, the public has to deal with that and, and address it. Um, having said that, one kind of interesting story is when, when the National Organic Program did come up and they asked for public input to it, <clears throat> I was in graduate school at the time, and what was interesting, I, th I think it was like 97, 98, what you were saying, and I started my job in 99 at, at Beltsville at USDA. And what was interesting is we were also, we're also in the same building that in 1980, there was a report that came out that was put together under the Corridor Administration that when Reagan came in, they, they stopped distribution of that report. It was called the USDA Report on Organic Farming. I can't remember the exact title, but that was the first federal report on organic farming. <clears throat> and it was very positive. And it pointed out that there's a lot of organic farmers doing things successfully. And that, that was kind of pushed to the back burner in 1980. And so when I came in, I kind of had that story in my mind. I kind of asked, well, what, <clears throat> what's the perspective of USDA about organic? And they said, you know, that NOP when, NO, when they <clears throat> asked for public feedback, the, um, there was more, more public input on that one government rule than it had ever been on any other rule in the whole history of the United States, right? So some like 275,000 people wrote in <clears throat> and said, no, you can't have, <clears throat> there was three things that, that, that the original NOSB put in, <clears throat> irradiated food, uh, well, there's, there's two other ones, genetic modification and, um, and the sludge. Those three things were not part of what NOSB asked to make organic. And the public came by, back and said, no, you can't do that. So they kicked those three things out of what the certified organic definition is. But because there was 275,000 people that responded to USDA, that is exactly what opened up USDA's eyes to the fact that there's this huge unmet need out there which is part of why Stephen and I can now do organic research, unfettered, without any, you know, and it's seen as a real positive thing. So that is the way that the government works, right? It's the public speaks their voice and things move. In this case, it's from the research perspective. You're raising a different issue, but that whole process set up the tone of things in a way that opened some doors. And so I just want to make that point. So, so what impact does it have on your Other things. Yeah, I, I, probably not too much of an effect because we don't do any things with hydroponics, but I mean, not, I'll, I'm not speaking for Stephen, but for me, I do organic research based on whatever the organic standards are. I don't, you know, and <clears throat> that's so what I do. Just, Michelle, just one thing. So everybody knows when she talks about the NOP, it's the National Organics Program, and that program is a regulatory program <laughs> that is based within the USDA Agriculture Marketing Service. So those standards are, are done to assure um, consumers that products that are produced um, organically meet um, all those, well, they, sell, they call it consistent uniform standards. And then remember that NOP really does not look at food safety or nutrition either. So just some, so you'll understand what she was talking about, the NOP, so. Anybody else have any comments or? I think, you know, on the scientist side, they're, they're trying to do the research to get out there, you know, to help the farmers. And so it's, it's two different sides. That's a problem. You know, 
Yeah. yeah. So I, I could just make it a comment, kind okay. of following on what you're saying is, you know, does it affect my program? My program is really driven by what I hear from farmers. Right. So it's not driven by the organic standards. So, so when I interact with farmers, well, you know, to, you know, I'll talk and they'll come up and ask questions and say this is an issue, you know, specifically disease oriented, and you know, uh, what what can we do about it? And we'll have discussions and follow up discussions, and I'll think of ideas of what I might be able to do with my knowledge to research that. And so I would say that from my university program, that it's much more driven by issues that farmers bring to me and organic farmers often, sometimes conventional farmers, everybody, you know, can bring ideas and needs. And then I would try to respond to those in my program, but not driven by um, the, the uh, regulatory aspects so much. Unless a grower would come to me and say, um, I want to reduce my use of some pesticide because it uh, has regulatory restrictions. But it would be driven by the farmer saying, this is a need that I have. What do you know about it? And how can you help me solve that problem? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for cla that's Just to clarify, my point was I def what I define as organic and how we do our organic research is driven by NOP to that extent. I mean, we don't use things that NOP doesn't allow is what I meant. But, oh, yeah, yeah. but yeah, the point about farmers is a really good one. Yeah, and, I, and I, that's why I want to underscore that. Is that I mean, that's why we're here. I mean, we've been coming to see for years, right? And a lot of you have seen us give presentations at the time of that presentation, that question and, and discussion section. It's us looking to you to give us input. You know, we're, we're here and we're our research programs. And in this, so you got that from the University of Maryland perspective, from the USDA, ARS perspective, it's the same. I mean, my whole research program is driven by the questions that come up at these meetings. You know, we hear endlessly that people don't like Harry Vetch because of the hard seed issue. We've been working for 10 years on this hard seed issue and Harry Vetch, and now we have a breeding program trying to remove hard seed from Harry Vetch because we think it's a good legume. So for those reasons, this session, what we're doing here today, I mean, we're here to get your input of what you need to improve your systems. I understand that you said you were doing some nematode research. Um, I assume that's with the cover crop program. And I'm curious, when you say nematode research, are you or is it are you doing nematodes associated with soybeans? Or are you doing nematodes associated because it's nematode is a big big window. I'm a vegetable farmer, not a corn and soybean farmer. And I'm interested in cover crops that will uh, fight naturally pest in my soil like nematodes? Well, I can say I've done all of it. I have done research where I've looked at plant parasitic nematodes, and these are the ones that attack the, um, we call them, maybe call them roundworms, that attack the roots of plants. But more recently, I have moved into looking at beneficial nematodes, and we call these the free-living nematodes. And the main reason why I started doing that is because a lot of people are interested into soil health. And one of the things they do is they use the term soil health and soil quality interchangeably, but they are different. So I started, so when we measure soil health, we actually need organisms that we can use to measure that health. And I found out that, and I don't like to admit this, but nematologists are really smart people. So they have determined these indexes. And based on these indexes, we can do, we can do different treatments in the soil, whether it's tillage, whether it's different cover crops, whether it's conservation tillage, whether it's using conventional synthetic insecticides. And we can look at the ratios of those different nematodes, whether they're bacterial feeder, whether they're onivores, whether they're predaceous nematodes. And we can put these into these different indexes that these nematodes ecologists have developed. And then based on that, we can determine, we can use that as an indicator of the health, how healthy the soil is. So that's mainly what I'm doing now. I used to look at plant parasitic nematodes, but since there has been this interest in soil health, I started looking at free living nematodes. And I work with nematologists who are capable of identifying all the nematodes below the soil uh, and help me with those indexes. So these would be nematodes that are in all system. Um, these free living nematodes, they're not going to be different in vegetable or conventional system soybeans. Maybe the ratio of these may be different depending on what those production practices are. But it seemed like the production practices is what mainly dominate what these nematodes are below the soil, not necessarily cropping systems that is being grown. 
So I can just speak a little bit about the plant parasitic nematodes many years before Saruti was here. I've been here very, very long. Um, um, I worked on um, um, the, the vegetable growers started growing uh, potatoes in, I think it was in Dorchester County, and um, had an issue with um, um, nematodes, root knot nematode was what it was, on potatoes. Um, and it's, you, all, you have to look at it as a cropping system issue because, um, because the nematodes are so influenced by other things. What happened was um, they, they had been having a cropping system and they just put one more that was, had some hosts that were available for root knot nematode, then they put the potato in in addition to the other hosts and so they had an additional host and um, just started to see more issues. So we did look at cover crops at that time and um, uh, things like sorghum sedan grass would, would suppress the nematode but in a transient way so it would reduce the nematode levels um, for a short time but then of course if you put your conventional um, or your um, host back in there the, the number would surge back up to, to where it was. So it's, it's a kind of thing that um, th the lesson I took away was these are great cover crops. You want to keep them in there, but you have to have a cropping system over the years that incorporates these suppressive uh, nematode, root knot nematode suppressive crops into your cropping system. So, um, you know, think about it long term and something that you would put in there um, every few years or something like that. And the other thing, um, the other comment I want to make was that back at that time we did have some, uh, we did have a nematologist at University of Maryland. Unfortunately, we've lost that person and so um, it's it's made some of this work a little bit of a challenge. So anyway, I haven't done anything recently. This, this would have been about 15 years ago. Um, fell in the middle. Are you saying it's a direct correlation between Nematodes and, and microbial activity or microbes in the soil to help? Uh, that's a little bit beyond me. I don't look at the comparison of microbial and, and free living nematodes. We haven't done that. Um, I should say we actually did a collaboration where we had a chemi chemi chemistry person who looks at that, but we haven't looked at the data to look at the comparison yet to see if we can see there's an association between the two. Um, as far as no-till, organic no-till farming, are we find it's better to control weeds like pond pigweed and, and mare's tail through no-till or conventional? Um, I'm going to hand that to the real weed scientist. <laughs> In general, with particularly with those two species, the it, it's a, a true no-till, organic no-till. It's it's a quite a challenge with both of them. That that uh, uh, conventional till has a place for for manage certainly marist tail, which is a winter annual. Uh, that that tillage uh, spring tillage does a is, is is a big influence on it. And and then with Palmer, you know one of the one of the advantages of having uh, you know disadvantages of of no till is you're limiting yourself in terms of some of the tactics that you can use unless you've got you know some very specialized equipment and with with uh, uh, high residue uh, uh, no-till cover crops uh, you start getting some breaks on the palmer amaranth and you really have very limited options whereas if you were in a conventional till system you would be able to come back with um, and more likely anyways, with cultivation, uh, flame weeders, possibly some of these other tactics. Um, so in, in, in a lot of cases, the conventional till for those two species are a preferred system for control. Yes, sir. Yeah, a specific question. We grow uh, heritage varieties of organic uh, grains, and one of our biggest problems is perennial wild garlic because it competes with the wheat, and by the time you're going to harvest the wheat or the rye or whatever, the, the bulblets of the, uh, the uh, garlic are exactly the same size, almost the same color, and are at the same height as the wheat heads. And that's complicated by the fact that it's a perennial weed, and as an organic grower, 
there's very little right now that I'm aware of that we can do to control that and change it. And so I'm, I'm kind of interested in what the broad spectrum of all your different disciplines might have as a solution to that problem. Hmm. 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 <laughs> are, are, you, are you tilling? Uh, are you? We, are, we are tilling. We're organic. Uh, we're not obviously not tilling the the uh, wheat once it's growing, but it's a you know it's a it's a major weed seed bank issue as well as something that then also regenerates at that growth stage. What what what's your crop preceding your your small grains your heritage small grains? Uh, generally speaking, it's either. Uh, Corn or it's alfalfa. So, are you tilling your corn? See, you, what, what I'm kind of getting at here is that uh, being a winter, a, a perennial, but primarily is producing those bulblets um, in the springtime because of its life cycle, of breaking up that life cycle, not necessarily with your small grains, but the previous crop or two that you're, that you're able to, to, to control it. And doing it before those bulblets start to uh, uh, develop, which unfortunately is, is in many cases is a later spring um, tillage time. Most perennials, their carbohydrates and their roots are going to be at the lowest just before they start to flower. So while garlic is a late spring flowering species, like you know with, with your uh, 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 small grains, so uh, delaying that tillage a little bit earlier or a little bit later, that you're disrupting that life cycle as much as you can before you, you know, uh, but, but previous to when you're put, putting in your small grains. That's going to be a real challenge to, to, to get to that point. There's no uh, organic herbicide that you can use to treat that in a field, whereas conventional wheat growers can come in with various things and knock down the population, not eliminate it. That's, so that's we're, correct. We're really limited in terms of what kinds of treatments. Yes, and, and it, you know, of all the, the uh, organic herbicides that I've tested, um, one, being very cost prohibitive to use them on broad acreage, but two that that uh, they they work very they work better on smaller uh, weeds. And when I say small, we're talking one to two inches. While they're very small, um, and like a lot of the conventional, unlike a lot of conventional growers that are using herbicides that have some residual activity after application, these uh, organic uh, bio herbicides don't provide that feature to them. So a lot of them will need multiple applications if they're going to be effective, which kind of takes them out of play in your scenario there. But, yep. Uh, probably a question for Stephen or Michelle. Uh, thinking about uh, trying to get manure on early or corn on top of a, a cereal legume cover crop. I know it's, I don't think it's legal in Maryland to do that and not incorporated at this point. Um, but if you're able to get it on in March, um, just timing wise, so it doesn't have to be put on right before corn planting, you know, when you're tilling the ground, um, how would the nutrients be available um, quickly to the corn, quick enough from that manure, or is it going to get tied up? If, once, once you till the corn or till the till the cover crop in in May and then plant corn, um, are you going to lose any of the the nutrients that year, or are they going to get released later? Or is the cover, that cover crop going to hold it and then release it like you want to the corn crop? Just just want to make sure I understand the question. So you've got your mixed cover crop, you got legume grass, clover, or and then or and then you're applying. What poultry litter? Poultry litter, like this, like in March or April, any time. Yeah, yeah. You any time before, you know, so it's not such a quick turnaround. And you're right, right when you're uh, like the crimson clover is flowering, you want that's when you want to till, do your tillage to kill it. Yeah, so you won't be tilling for a couple months yeah, yeah. or something. Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure I had that straight. Where you're not going to get run off from this. Yeah. You have an actively growing crop yeah. there to put it on. Well, so poultry litter then has a fair amount of ammonium in it, right? That's already as as lose that, I guess. Yeah. 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 Y
Yes. Well, no, the, I would say that your cover crop's probably going to be taking that up because you're yeah. it's starting to grow right now, right? So that's like adding conventional fertilizer almost, yeah. right? So that that you're should, still going to get volatility from. Yeah, you'll you're still going to volatilize a lot of that. Yeah. You know, so you're still going to lose. I mean, how much do you think you're losing? Well, it depends. That depends on how dry your soil is on your pH too. So. If you get a rainfall on it and it yeah. moves it into the soil, that's rain, yeah, know. yeah. But that's a good point, Stephen. Yeah, you might lose some. How big's your cover crop right now? Oh, I don't know. It's not very. I mean, it, uh, you can wait till it gets actually growing. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is that also going to if you did that? Would that offset? Is that going to be efficient for the clover or the legume? Yeah. Is it gonna, not fix as much nitrogen because it has nitrogen there. That's another. Yeah, thing. I mean that's that's exactly right, Aaron. I mean you know so if you're going to put down poultry litter on top of a grass legume cover crop mixture, you know you're going to expect a couple of things. One, you're going to expect to be you're fertilizing your cover crop. So sure, you're going to retain a fair bit of those nutrients and, and some of their nutrients at risk of being lost are not because you've got a growing cover crop there to take that up. So as far as kind of a, a net loss, the main loss is going to be that volatility, you know, that you're going to lose some. But uh, uh, the grass legume cover crop is going to take it up, but there's no question it's going to favor the grass. So especially early on right now, we all know our legumes are not that aggressive. They're slow to get going in the fall. If we got a late planting, then they're still in the spring. We're waiting for that, that take to come. And, and so if you put that uh, high levels of N down early, it's pretty simple equation. You're going to be fertilizing your grass. That legume's not going to have an, you know, the same incentives. And so it's just going to, you're going to get a much more heavy dominated cover crop mixture of a grass. So it's going to select for that. Uh, but if you want that, then, then there's a win. And so then you also get uh, a, still a pulse of nutrients in the system that will slow release, but because you're putting it on early enough, you're going to get a fair bit of that at planting. And any of these grass legume cover crops where you've got over 30 to 40% of that mixture is, is a legume, you're not going to have the same issues of N immobilization as if you had a pure grass. So I, I don't think you'll have too much you know, tie-up risk and you know at planting into it, but you will be selecting for a much heavier grass stand, which over the course of the growing season is going to then result in less overall end coming from your cover crop because it's going to be staying immobilized in the system longer and and just less released over the course of the growing season. But if you were going to get seventy five or eighty pounds out of your clover, you may only be getting forty now because it, you've got to get it out of the rye or the. Is that what you're saying? Is yeah, there's there's a combination of two things that are going on, right? So whenever our cover crop biomass is equal parts legume and grass, for the most part, I mean this is not a you know it's not in stone, but generally whenever our cover crop mixture is 50% legume and 50% grass, I'm not talking about the seeding rates, I'm not talking about anything other than just the composition of the biomass. Uh, once you get to about 50% legume, you actually have the same amount of total nitrogen content in that cover crop as you would if you had a legume alone. You generally, in these mixtures, you can achieve the same level of total nitrogen, but the actual release of that nitrogen during the growing season is very different. The legume would release most of it, if not you know, all of it would be available during the growing season, whereas a grass legume mixture, you're gonna reduce it by some amount. And the more you favor that grass, it's just where you're gonna push the equation. Did, did you say you're planting corn in there, or did you say, yeah? High nitrogen. I, I want to address that, Aaron. Maybe one of the other things we could do, one of the other tools is the PSNT, the pre-side dress nitrate test. So maybe we could go out and do some 12-inch samples just to get an idea of what nitrate nitrogen might be available. If you want to do some trials, you know, we could, could look at that. Just a thought. So. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question about um, the beneficial research you do. Um, you know, I know beneficials are important to plant, but a question I would have, especially if I'm doing like an enterprise budget or something for a crop, how do you document the benefit of planting plants for beneficials and spending that time? Like, is there a way for me to measure um, how much more productivity I have because I planted this plant to attract the beneficial? Uh, the question she's asking is how does she if she has is growing plants with beneficials, how can she track to see if there's a economic benefit for that? And the answer is, is it's not possible. 
Um, we can do it because basically what we do is when we set up studies, we have studies where you may have beneficials, where you're trying to have these flowering plants attract beneficials, and then others where we don't. And then a, a couple of ways we do it, we take in the expense associated with plant net beneficial uh, mix, which take in consideration how much of um, crop you're going to take out of production for that, and then we look at yield. How much yield gain is it? How much, if it's conventional, how much reduction in chemical use? So we look at all those different variables, and then we, we make that assessment, um, which one is it economically feasible. Um, the, the tricky thing about that is it only tells you the economic benefits of that particular time. Sometimes those economic benefits don't show up in the first field season. It may be the second field season. It may be the third field season. So that's why I say it's difficult, it would be difficult for you to do it unless you had that control where you can compare. It just seems like it would be great to have a metric like that, especially if we're trying to encourage, you know, regenerative agriculture and crop, soil ecology, et cetera. Um, thank you. And the other situation with that is people who do hardcore biocontrol people, conservation biocontrol people, they tend to not care about yield. If you look in biocontrol journals, you will see a lot about beneficial insects, their benefits, and if they got an increase in parasitism, which is these wasps, maybe wasps or, or flies that lay their eggs and they kill the host, and they talk about the benefits, but very seldom do they talk about yield in a biocontrol journal. So a follow-up question would be, uh, what would be a good resource for a vegetable farmer to find out information on research that you do on the economics of beneficial in a window of time? Like, is there a clearinghouse of data? Is there, like, a publication? I, I haven't seen it. Okay. And typically for us, it, um, for that particular aspect, we usually, we collaborate with ag, economic, ag economy people. And then they tend to publish that separate. In scholarly journals, right? In scholarly journals. Okay. But what I'm trying to do is, um, typically with my research, I publish in, in journals because we have to to keep our job to get raises and stuff but but then I also try to take some of that and I print it into a layman extension type article and hopefully what I want to do in the future is when we start doing that I also want to have ag economists um, who work with us to also um, publish it in layman term okay, thank you. who else has a question yes sir are any of you doing research on interseeding cover crops, mixed cover crops, um, in uh, primarily either vegetables or, or corn? And does it have a fit in this region? I'm doing a lot of better work on interseeders, so I'll, I'll chime in. Um, how long is, how how long of a session do we have? He's <laughs> <laughs> got a whole session. That? Yeah, um, I don't even think I'm covering it that much. I'm covering it a little bit maybe, but um, you know, interseeding is exciting, right? Because we're we're trying to figure out how to get cover crops in the system, right? So aerial seeding is interseeding. You know, if you're interse if you're putting seeds in the ground when the corn is at uh, you know side dress, that's interseeding. So anytime we are putting cover crops in the system when there's a living cash crop, that's interseeding. What are we what we call it and and the specific equipment that's doing it, whether it's a high boy that's got you know forced air systems shooting it to the soil surface, or whether it's aerial broadcasted by a plane or a high boy, or whether you know we've been working with the interseeder that is essentially a glorified drill where several of the units have been removed where the corn or the soybean rows would go so that we can drill seed three rows of, of cover crops between the crop rows. And, and why are we doing that? For all the reasons you'd expect, right? Is that better seed to soil contact? You have better, you know, issues when you've got, you know, the surface soil dries out, you're going to get, you know, better take from the cover crop. Um, the problem with all interseeding is that you can't get around the fact that another living plant is competing with another living plant. And so the better your cash crop does, the harder it is to get a good take with interseeding. Now, most of the folks who are having success with this interseeding, like with this, this drilling that we're doing around side dress, you know, those folks are like north of I-80. So you get north of I-80 where their, their canopies don't canopy as hard, their crops don't grow as fast, their biomass isn't as big, they have less competitive effect, and so they're getting much better takes. So a lot of the speakers that are going around the country that are you know, preaching how great interseeding is working. Yeah, a lot of those folks are coming out of regions where they're further north, where it works really well. So we've interseeded a ton into corn, we've interseeded a ton into soybeans. 
Uh, I know there's a bunch of people in the room with aerial seed, and aerial seeding seems to be, of all the interseeding in this region, the most take one because we've got planes too because anything earlier just doesn't work that well in this region. We have a hot, dry climate, and we have fast-growing cash crops. So soybeans, forget it. Not even an option. We can't get a single cover crop to take in full season soybeans uh, because it just can't be so hard and it competes so aggressively. Corn will get a decent take some years. Now, there are certain species that work better than others, but the problem with corn is that we produce really big corn in this region comparatively to up north of, in the northeast, and uh, so you get a lot of that stover that chokes out the, the cover crop. So even if you get a nice take with the interseeder in the, cover, in the corn, that residue can kind of choke out some of the, the cover crops. So it's been a challenge. We've had some successes. It's been mixed. We're, we're still exploring aerial versus interseeding. Where we have had the most success and that I'm really excited about, I'll mention that briefly in my talk this afternoon, is in double crop soybeans. So not too many organic producers do double crop soybeans, or at least my experience has been less because they're focused on cover crops that they need to maximize nitrogen for the, subs, the following corn crop. But if you are doing double crop soybeans, we're having a tremendous success in wide row double crop soybeans. So on a 30 inch row spacing, double crop soybeans will come in, will intercede in August or early September. You didn't want me to keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, there it's working great. We're producing like three to 5,000 pounds per acre of biomass. It's not really interfering with the soybeans at harvest. And we're able to now all of a sudden in a system where there's no cover crop, get really bumper amounts of nitrogen from a legume. What other questions do we have? What research do you want done to this? You set me up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want this panel with you. I, I want uh, research uh, on particularly for cake fungicides uh, and can we, is there a tool that could be developed that can answer how to be able to tell the difference between down and down to the top and down to the top and like late like the issue of on the same thing? You know what it is about sending you a sample. <laughs> That's one. And secondly, uh, and I think I've said this to Michael before, Michelle, uh, um, you guys do really great work. Get it out of Gulfstream. <laughs> <laughs> over here. It's over here. You know, I mean, I should even find it. Google should find it. Oh, Same thing with you, Mark. You guys do really great work recently. But you don't be keeping a secret. <laughs> <laughs> At least publish it somewhere. So if I Google something, it will give me some references other than uh, if you spray it with uh, cat urine and kill it. Does that work? No. <laughs> So, so the questions for me were uh, uh, identification tools yes, and um, and work on biofungicides or biorationals that yes. can be used in organic systems yeah. and yeah yeah so so um, both excellent and needed things um, the uh, the identification tool that's really tough I mean really I that it I'm depends on um, on education I think that we're getting to the point where there's more like identifiable pictures. On the on the web, and maybe it's a matter of making like um, I have a counterpart at New York who's an excellent photographer. She's awesome. She has like a new tool, so maybe it's a, a point point of like getting the word out on where maybe to look a little bit for that stuff. And I'd also say that in terms of samples, you don't have to bring them to me. You can bring them to Jenny or Nate or, uh, and they can help us out and by getting them to the, the appropriate person. So, so there should be resources in your county and same in Delaware, resources in your county that you can, you know, that you can get those samples to because it, it's key in, in controlling a disease is that you have to know what you're trying to control. Um, and. And so that, that I would say that for the identification piece, and then you know the other piece, I, I totally agree with you uh, that we need, um, yeah, <laughs> that, well, that we need um, more research uh, um, on on things that can be done in the field after your crop is growing um, to try to manage epidemics, and um, we're definitely not there yet. And there's lots of new tools coming on the market. Um, 
it's really a challenge to, to uh, look at them from our standpoint because it takes people power and we don't have as much people power as we would like. So I, I it's tough. And farmers, and that's why, it, 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 you know, you're secondly going to make us, and all of a sudden it's like, what do I do? I hear about it when they whip them out, but they don't know where to go, and most of the younger people are, are tech savvy, but I couldn't find it on my smartphone. That's what, if we could get there, and I know we don't have money, we don't have staff, but Dean Rudy telling my Talk to you. <laughs> Actually, that, I mean, yeah. that is where the public does have a role to play, right? I mean, USDA ARS, we have no extension or outreach component right. explicitly written into what we do. We are just research. We're the Agricultural Research Service, right? So we partner with the University of Maryland, which is why we're here, you know, doing, you know, we do more organic research at at USDA than University of Maryland does overall, but we work with three or four university people, and right. that's one way of getting things out, both with the extension, but also with the teaching. We have a lot of University of Maryland students, Stephen especially, he's got about 500 of them, I think. He's got a huge <laughs> program. So th there are definitely avenues for that, um, and, and extension's all been cut, right? And which is kind of what you're talking about, fewer people, but, and that's where the public needs to, to you guys have better, you guys have more influence than we do for that type of thing. And it, it is hard. I mean, they don't know extension even exists. So, you know, so how do we get to those young beginning farmers to tell, hey, call your county ag agent and we'll get, you know, in touch with the specialist that can help us. So we need to, to figure that, keep, we're always figuring that out. Because well, some, of the, some of that information, Earl, I mean, is, is out there. Um, we don't necessarily tag it as organic. You know, uh, and, and part of it is because it's not done under certified organic conditions. It's, it's our tillage studies or it's our uh, uh, cover crop trials, you know, which are designed to, to cover a multitude of situations, both organic and conventional. But uh, uh, we, we, in the last few years, uh, we, we have been putting more of our research reports up online. And uh, to come to the defense of USDA, I will say, <laughs> You know, when I started, uh, there was, it was Beltsville and Beltsville alone, but uh, there has been an awful lot of their work that's been done, you know, from New York down to North Carolina and getting off, uh, uh, you know, branching out and collaborating with a lot of people. So a lot of the work that we've been doing, this collective we in the North, in the Mid-Atlantic working on cover crops, a lot of that has been very involved with uh, the, the USDA. I think I met Michelle when he first came to Mark. Jim, uh, when we retired here. Anderson? Yeah, I was there. He used to come over a long time ago. What, what else, what else was, do you I'm just going to add to that because I, I took you know, only a partial offense to that comment. <laughs> for, for a guy who has a 100% research appointment, I feel like I do well. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're getting I mean, I probably do about 30 or 40 percent of my position is extension, you know, and, and so we're, we're at field days. You know, this, this event is, is funded partly because of the grants that we're writing. And then also, I mean, Delaware manuals that are coming out, Penn State manuals that are coming out, North Carolina manuals that are coming out, those state agronomy guides, we have co-authorships and a lot of those products, our data is in there. And then I... This is the perfect place to showcase that we have in the last couple of years formed the Northeast Cover Crop Council, which is a regional organization that is paralleling the, what the Midwest has done. And now this is also a, there's a Southern Cover Crop Council. And I know cover crops may sound like, well, what am I interested in? Is it just cover crops? But as you know, in organic systems, cover crops are just part of the system. And so this, this meeting is there to address knowledge gaps. There's, um, there's field tours. There's... Um, all sorts of uh, um, presentations and events this next year. Last year was at Cornell. This year it's going to be at Penn State. The following year we're probably going to host it down here. Uh, but it's a great event. It's a lot of farm involvement. Industry is involved in this event. Uh, all the different sectors of the ag sector are involved. And we're also actively developing decision support tools, web-based tools to help guide decision making. So that, that's coming. If you want that kind of activity, Penn State's the place to be in November. Okay. Um, what other 
um, ideas for research. Anybody have any other? Yes, sir. Uh, question about, is there an optimal uh, field size, maybe, so that you can, or do large fields have the more risk for, for pests spreading and doing more damage, or is there an ideal field size, that, like smaller fields together, that beneficial pests can cross over to the other pests quicker, or <coughs> stop the spread of uh, disease or anything like that? I'll say something. For, I don't. I don't think it'll reach that far. Um, I'll. I'll just say something quick from the disease standpoint, and uh, there we go. I think it's working. Um, and then I'll hand it to Sarudi. From the disease standpoint, I've never seen anything about optimal C field size. We know that certain pests move differently when the plants are space differently and sometimes they can actually be more intense if your plant spacing is greater for instance in small grains but um, in terms of field size um, it really depends it really I would say that the the only field size relationship I can think of would be your ability to manage um, from from the disease standpoint you know your ability to get out there and do something um, whether it's beforehand and trying to get suppressive cover crops in there or, or like in season, your ability to manage, um, you know, if you need to take remedial action during the, the season with a biorational material or something like that. But I don't know, other than that, I can't think of any field size issue for diseases. But I'll let Surudi talk about insects. Um, I would say with respect to insect colonization, field size could be an issue if it's a um, perimeter colonizer. Um, you think about like stink bugs or something. So if you have a really large field and they come out and basically they're going to be along the perimeter, which is a good thing because then you could just manage it on that perimeter. If it's a small field, then they basically going to spread out through the whole field because from their perspective, that entire field is perimeter. So that's where I can see it could be an issue. Um, but, but again, but many insects, they're not necessarily perimeter colonized. They're just sort of spread out through the field. Um, some instances also depending on where your field is in relation to where they're going to dipause at. Um, if, there, if there's a lot that are in dipause, say in a wooded area, and your field is small, once they come out of dipause, then they're going to be all over your entire field. So field size is probably more of an issue for insects based on the number that are colonizing and the size of the field. If you have a lot that are colonizing at that particular stage because they're all coming out of their overwintering stage, then it's going to be a problem. Um, but other than that, I can't think of a situation where field size would be an issue other than um, it's based on a ratio of insects that are colonizing based on the field size. All right, so lunchtime is almost upon us. Um, for the, my panel, do you have any final thoughts? Or they'll be around uh, most of the rest of the day, most of them. So you know, but Kate, you want to? We'll start on the other end. Sure, I'll, I'll just give some final thoughts because it kind of follows up on this. As you go back and think about your issues that you have, whether they're about cover crops or diseases or insects or beneficials, um, if you would just try to communicate them um, when you see, you know, even your extension educators. You know, I mentioned that a lot of times our research responds to farmer issues, but sometimes those farmers' issues come through the, the ed county educators because you interact with them a lot. And um, they can come to us and say, you know, I have somebody who's having a problem with this particular issue. So um, I would encourage uh, communication either directly or you know, your, your extension folks will, will definitely pass the information on to us because we talk a lot and do a lot of joint things together. Yeah, I would also add that um, in the organic field, more than other fields, when you're applying for a USDA grant, which is how we are able to do a lot of what we do, you often, well, all the organic programs require you to have farmer or extension support. And so, uh, we might approach some of you, and we have in the past, to, to write letters to support our grants. And coincidentally, there's grants due at the end of March. <laughs> and so we might be hitting up a few of you guys or gals to uh, 
write up some letters for us. We actually have one drafted. Stephen has one on his computer that uh, if you are interested in the topics we're working on now, which includes cover crops, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, soil carbon, soil organic matter, just come up and approach us and say, hey, I'd love to write a letter. And, and we'll open Stephen's computer, and you can put your name in where there's a blank, and you can twist the wording however you want, and we'll be happy to work with you. I want to add one more thing to that. Um, another thing that a lot of these grants are requesting nowadays is that we have an advisory council. Advisory council is something like farmers or it could be people in the industry. So if you're interested in being on advisory council, that would be your best way to dictate what we do. Because basically what we do is you, you have to be involved in the planning of the experiment or the planning of the project. And not only that, once we have to, at the end of the year, we have to present those results to you. And then you decide, should we continue in that same direction or should we change it? And this is mandatory now that many of these grant agents are requiring. So you could sort of uh, maybe tell Jenny or whoever the extension uh, personnel in your county that you'd be very interested in serving on advisory council for grants. And then um, when we apply for a grant um, and we're trying to develop advisory council, then we could contact you and ask you to be a part of that advisory council and help us uh, establish the protocols, the objectives of that particular grant. This is really a critical point that's being raised. Um, yes, yeah. In the organic research community at this point, you practically cannot get funded unless you show active stakeholder involvement from the conception of the ideas to even sometimes in the case of the implementing the project. So this for us is what that venue is, right? So we come here you know, annually, we get feedback from you, we get input that shapes our research questions, and so we design our questions based on that. You know, and so while many of you feel like, wow, we talk to Steve all the time, he knows what we're interested in, what we want to work on, sure. But a lot of these people on the panel, because organic researchers are applying on these panels all the time, they often, they often don't have reviewers that are active organic researchers. So they don't know us. They don't want to take our word for it. So these letters from you is just a proof of concept that, yeah, we do come to this event. We do listen to what you say. We are trying to develop that research on your input. And that letter just shows this community of people evaluating us. Yes, he's not just saying he does. These farmers are saying, yes, he does. So that's kind of what that letter is also doing. Thanks. Just to add a little bit new, different wrinkle to that on the research side. Nevin Dawson's out here, and Nevin is with the Northeastern SARE program, which has opportunities for you to do some of your own on-farm research, uh, some funding available for supplies and equipment in your time. So if you're interested in doing something on your farm, see Nevin as well. He may have some opportunities for you. <laughs> Well, let's give our scientists a round of applause. Thank you very much.